My name is Don Mercer. In this video, we will examine factors influencing drying. Financial support for production of this series of video presentations was provided by the Széchenyi Society, founders of the Hungarian programs at the University of Toronto. The Széchenyi Society sponsorship is gratefully acknowledged. I would personally like to thank Dr. Leventi Diashadi, professional engineer and fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, who is a professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry at the University of Toronto. Dr. Diashadi's considerable efforts in coordinating this project are greatly appreciated. The material in these video presentations is based on an ebook published in November of 2014. Its title is An Introduction to the Dehydration and Drying of Fruits and Vegetables. It is available on the International Union of Food Science and Technology website, which can be accessed at www.iufost.org. We will begin with a very brief introduction and will follow this with discussion of a number of factors that influence drying, including size or thickness, air temperature, and air velocity. Then we will look at how moisture removal actually takes place and go on and look at stagnant boundary layers and case hardening. We will finish with some summary comments. There is more to drying than simply placing slices of a material on a rack and blowing hot air across them. We will now examine some of the factors which influence the drying process. We have already introduced the concept of size or thickness in a previous discussion. However, it is something that should be confirmed with experimental data. The thicker the slices of apples which are shown in this test, the slower they dried. And in this diagram you can see apples with thicknesses ranging from 0.4 centimeters thick to 0.8 centimeters thick. Following the line for the 0.4 centimeter thick apples, we can see that they reached a certain weight in less time than the 0.8 centimeter thick apples. And this is because in the case of the 0.8 centimeter thick apples, the water had to travel further to the surface to be removed than it did in the thinner slices. About five to six millimeters or one quarter of an inch is a good thickness to use for many fruits and vegetables. It is easy to visualize this thickness when cutting and it is an easy thickness to handle. Drying times are also reasonable with this thickness of material. Air temperature also has a tremendous impact on drying. As the temperature of the air increases, the rate of water removal increases as well, but we have to be careful here as we will see later in this presentation. In this graph we see the weight of pepper slices when they are dried at 50 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius, and as you can see from the dashed line it takes less time for the drying at 60 degrees Celsius to produce a given weight of dried product than it does for air at 50 degrees Celsius. They are shown as T1 for the 60 degrees Celsius air and T2 for the 50 degrees Celsius air. Air velocity is another factor which you need to take into account. As the speed of the air increases, the rate of water removal tends to increase as well until a maximum rate of water removal is reached. Here we see two air velocities, 0.25 centimeters per second and 0.5 meters per second. In the case of the 0.25 meters per second, the drying is much slower than it is with the faster velocity, and this is due to the fact that the air movement is not sufficient to sweep the moisture away from the surface of the material. In the case of the 0.5 meter per second airflow, the air is capable of sweeping away the moisture from the surface 
and drying proceeds much more rapidly than at the lower air velocity. However, if we increase the air velocity to 0.75 meters per second or even 1.0 meters per second, we do not get a substantial increase in the rate of water removal. So it's best to choose an air velocity that works well for the removal of water from the surface, yet doesn't increase the expenses to power the fan at a higher speed. Now let's take a look at how moisture removal actually takes place. During the early stages of drying, moisture removal takes place from a pool of moisture on the saturated surface of the material. And here we see a representation of a piece of material being dried with moisture on the saturated surface which essentially forms a pool of moisture from which the warm dry air moving across the surface can evaporate that water and take it out of the dryer. Of course moisture has to diffuse to the surface from the inside of the slice of material. As long as there is sufficient moisture at the surface of the material to keep it saturated, the rate of water removal will stay constant. When the surface is no longer saturated, diffusion of moisture from inside the material begins to control the rate of drying. This rate will decrease as more and more moisture is removed. In this diagram, we see that there is no pool of moisture on the surface and diffusion will control the drying rate. So taking a look at the diagram, please note that there is no moisture pool on the surface and the slow evaporation of moisture from the surface is due to the slow diffusion of moisture from the inner portions of the material being dried. You need to recognize when the drying mechanism changes from removal on the saturated surface to diffusion being the controlling factor. This is called the critical moisture content. Typical stages of drying are shown in this diagram. When cold material enters a dryer, it may need to go through a warm-up period which is shown as being from points A to point B on this graph. As you can see, there is very little change in the moisture content since there is little or no evaporation during the warm-up period. After the material has been sufficiently warmed and evaporation begins to take place from the moisture pool on the saturated surface, we go through what is known as the constant rate drying period. Because of the saturated surface, moisture is removed at a steady or constant rate and we have a linear portion of the graph from points B to point C. After all of the moisture has been removed from the saturated surface of the material, we enter into the falling rate drying period where diffusion begins to control the rate of drying. So as more and more moisture is removed from the material, the rate of diffusion slows and we see the rate of drying slow down until we reach point D on the graph where we get a very low moisture content. Many drying processes do not have a warm-up period and this is typical when the product is at room temperature or slightly above since it doesn't need to be warmed up before evaporation begins to occur at the surface. The constant rate drying period may be quite short in some drying processes and in most of the drying processes that I have conducted using lab scale dryers or home food dehydrators, the constant rate drying period lasts for approximately two hours or even less. You need to remember that you cannot rush the diffusion process in the falling rate drying period, so don't be impatient, just wait until all of the moisture has diffused to the surface and has been removed by the hot air traveling across it. Now let's take a look at what we know as the stagnant boundary layer. When there is insufficient air circulation in a dryer, a situation may arise where moisture evaporating from the surface of the material causes the adjoining air to become saturated with water vapor. If this happens, water removal will cease 
or become extremely slow. This is the development of a stagnant boundary layer and it must be avoided for proper drying to take place. We will look at this in the following diagram, but before we do, let's consider another example of a stagnant boundary layer. We wear sweaters to keep a stagnant boundary layer of air against our bodies when we want to stay warm. The material of the sweater traps a layer of air against our skin. Our skin then heats this layer of air which cannot escape and that keeps us warm. However, in warm weather when we want to cool down, we often use a fan to blow air across our bare arms which removes the stagnant boundary layer of air and that allows us to cool down rather than heating up. In this diagram, we see a slice of material with a stagnant boundary layer of air around it shown in blue. We've got a saturated surface with a pool of moisture present. Moisture evaporating from this pool goes into the stagnant air around the material and saturates it with moisture. This creates an equilibrium relationship between the saturated surface and the saturated air and as long as the air is saturated, no more water can be absorbed by it. To eliminate the stagnant boundary layer, it is necessary to increase the velocity of the air in the dryer. This sweeps away the moist air from the surface of the material and replaces it with fresh dry air which will promote evaporation from the surface of that material. Air velocity has an important role in dryer operations which is often overlooked and this is particularly important when it comes to the stagnant boundary layer. 0 0.5 meters per second of airflow works well in most of the drying tests that I have done in removing the stagnant boundary layer. In many dryers, such as the home food dehydrators that you may buy, the air velocity is set by the manufacturer, but it is sufficient to sweep away the stagnant boundary layer. You should also beware of excessive temperatures when drying materials. The mistake that a lot of people make is assuming that if 50 degrees Celsius is good for drying, then 80 degrees Celsius must be a lot better. This is a totally erroneous assumption that can lead to serious problems. The problem is called case hardening. In normal drying, there is a continuous removal of water at or near the surface of the material. And here you see warm air blowing across the surface of the material and moisture is leaving the slices. The air leaving the dryer is somewhat cooler and contains more moisture than the warm dry air that was entering the dryer. So as we keep replenishing the supply of warm dry air and blowing it across the surface, we get the moisture being removed. Excessively high temperatures can remove the surface moisture quite quickly, which you may think is an advantage. However, this dries out the surface before moisture from the inside of the material can diffuse outwards and reach that surface. The result is the formation of a dry, often leathery layer around the material, and this layer then acts as a barrier to further moisture removal. And here we see how very hot air blowing across the surface of a pepper slice will cause the pepper slice to shrink and develop a dry outer layer. This dry outer layer prevents moisture from leaving the slice. After a while the material will feel dry to the touch and will have a leathery texture that makes it seem like the drying is complete. However, with time, the moisture that is trapped inside the material will find its way to the surface of the leathery layer. The end result is often mold growth which may occur on the surface of the packaged product. So once again you cannot rush the diffusion of moisture in a drying process. Do not fall victim to the temptation to use high temperatures to speed up a drying process. And let's repeat this just to emphasize the point. You must maintain a suitable air temperature
and have sufficient air velocity to dry things properly. Here we see a photograph showing the temperature of 52 degrees Celsius for the drying air used with a sample of apples. The sample of apples is almost completely dry and is down to approximately 25 grams in the dryer that I was using for this experiment. In this photograph we see an anemometer which is used to measure the linear velocity of air in a dryer. From the digital display we can see that the air was traveling at 0.48 meters per second when this test was taken. In summary then, drying of food products is a process that depends on the rates of diffusion of moisture from the internal portions of the material being dried. There are several things that you can do to optimize drying. You can address sample configuration, you can use a suitable air velocity, and you can use an appropriate air temperature. You must respect the fact that drying is a kinetic process that is highly dependent upon time. You cannot rush diffusion by increasing the temperature of the dryer. This often results in case hardening which actually slows drying and can lead to product spoilage. In order to dry a product effectively and efficiently you must have an appreciation of the factors influencing drying and set up conditions in your dryer to conform to the water removal kinetics. Thank you very much.